Dominic, wedding DJ. And this is Serena, wedding planner. And together we are the, the wedding, wedding duo. duo. We are here to talk all things weddings. Planning a wedding can be stressful, but we are here to help. So before you say, that's it, we're going to Vegas, don't go to Vegas. Let's have some fun. Join us as we answer your wedding questions and help navigate planning one of the biggest days of your life with The, the Wedding, wedding duo. duo. And now we're back. From outer space. You just walked in. No, we're not going to keep that going. That um, so face. we are back. Wedding Duo <laughs> Podcast, Episode 11. Here we are. Hello. And, <laughs> super excited to be chatting with y'all again. I'm excited about today's episode. You know why? Why? Because this affects the DJ often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we are going to be chatting today about optimizing your floor plan. The floor plan. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. So what options do you have as far as a floor plan is concerned? And then some tips and tricks about making sure that things look nice. And are functional. And are functional. Functional is a good thought. You have. might be thinking like floor plan, how many different variations could there be? Oh my God, you mm -hmm. have no idea. You have no, <laughs> there's, there's so many different directions that you can take a floor plan, but the first place to start is where y'all going to sit, the couple. So yes, there's four that we see the most um, that we're going to talk about. And I actually have, I have floor plans. I have schematics. I have Visual aids. A, a visual aid that if you're watching on YouTube, that'll be great. If you're listening in your car on the drive home from work, you're like, I, that doesn't help me. But we'll talk through it. And if you listen to it and you go, I really want to see what the heck they're talking about, go Check pull it, it up on, on YouTube, YouTube and yeah. you can see it there. So um, so let's talk about where y'all sit, the couple. Uh, generally, there's a couple. <laughs> and we can start there. Most of you have probably seen the head table layout. And I'm showing a a floor plan here. Let me get it so it doesn't reflect it. The, the the head table floor plan. Uh, and usually the bride and groom sit central facing their crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Thusly, right? If you're if you're watching the YouTube, this will be easier. But like I said, I'll try to describe it more for those of you that are just listening. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the head table. I think people, just, they do that because that's what, that's what people do, right? But the bride and groom usually sit or the couple usually sit in the middle with maybe best man and maid of honor to their immediate left and right. Mm -hmm. And then it oftentimes gets one-sided. So you're facing the crowd, right? But you lose a whole second half of that table. I mean, I've had people where they wrap around both sides, right? And the plus ones are up there and you have a really long head table. But you're not like, I don't know, it's not, it's not as picture friendly because you got the back of people's heads there. If they're shooting it, if they're taking pictures and video this way and the guests are looking in the back of the heads. Um, so usually people do a one-sided head table. And it, I mean, it, it's fine, but all your besties are to your left and right. And when you're trying to like talk with them, you're like, what? I'm sorry. Hey, you know, you're looking left and right. Trying to talk with your 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 peeps because the peeps are the ones that are in the wedding party often, right? Right, and it can get a little bit long, like the table. If you do end up having like plus ones in your entire bridal party, so sometimes depending on the room that you're using, it doesn't work as well. If you have like a long room and then you also have a long table, um, you've got to consider your space. So that's something that when we're talking about these different versions. Uh, you're going to want to be mindful of like, what space are you filling? Is it a square room? Is it a long room? Is it an L shape? You know, there are all sorts <laughs> of different styles of spaces that you're going to want to consider when you actually go to fill those spaces with tables. And let's talk about these plus ones. If you can set it up and we'll talk about some other tables where the plus ones at the same table work better, but this one generally doesn't with the head table because it just gets to be too many. If you have, even if you have five people in your wedding party on each side, that's a, yes. Do the math there, people. That's a lot of people. And that's what table. I meant. Like, yeah. that's too many people going on either direction. Mm -hmm. You'll hit the wall at some point. And that's not a big wedding party. That have five bridesmaids and five groomsmen. That's right. pretty common. But then you put their plus ones, plus the two of you. I mean, that's a that's a big table if everybody's sitting on one side, right? It's just, it doesn't. So what works wanna, better? You don't want to limit your, your wedding party just because you can't fit them at the table. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But real quick, before we move on, the plus ones. If you don't have plus one sitting at your at your table with their date or their spouse, right? Uh, they get put out at one of these tables out here, right? Because um, usually, while we're on this one, usually people put parents on his parents on this side, her parents on that side, or whatever, right in that proximity to the where the couple are sitting, right? Because that works well. Um, that's where the vendors are usually looking for them too, right? And if you're yes. going to do a open seating chart, usually those ones are 
reserved, reserved, right, for the parents. And maybe you reserve two on each side for their grandparents or whatever is coming to. But if the plus ones are not in the wedding party, they get seated out here with your cousins. Oftentimes, they know no one other than their date, right? And their date is sitting at the head table and they're cast out here with the, with the crazy cousins. And if you've got somebody who's shy as a plus one, that is hard on them. Yes. But the other thing is, if they go at the head table, uh, maybe they didn't dress appropriately. This is what they always worry about too. This is, is such a weird thing. You this get is a weird thing. It drives me crazy. But your, your, your sister, who's your maid of honor, starts dating this guy a month before your wedding. She brings him. He shows up in a, in a short sleeve t-shirt with a ball cap on and he's in all your pictures and you're like that doesn't happen get him out of there. i mean oh seriously. i've seen it it drives me crazy <laughs> but it's something to consider do you want uh your wedding party with you and then do you want their plus ones with you uh and it is nice if they can all get up there but it can it can be a lot my favorite layout you know what my favorite layout well that's is, what right? i was asking earlier like how do we resolve the fact like if you do have either a large wedding party or you want to have the plus ones what is a better layout for that type of group? Well, and again, it's my favorite. It's the sweetheart table. Bing, sweetheart table. Just the two of you sit there and uh, and you can decorate it really cute, right? Right. And so let me describe this for people that aren't watching on YouTube. A sweetheart table is generally like an eight foot, maybe a six foot rectangular table where the couple sits alone at that table. And then usually what oh, you have- the round too. You can have a small round there too. I mean, yeah, it could be, depending on what options you have for table tables. For <laughs> um, and then usually the other tables, the guest tables are rounds um, throughout the room. Sometimes I've seen where they do rounds and rectangular tables like throughout the space. But again, it depends on what you have available to you. If the venue only offers round tables, that's usually what you're going to go with. Um, so that's something you need to consider when you're talking to your venue about how to lay out the space. And how many people fit at these rounds? Right. So usually you do eight to 10 people at a round. You can do the larger, like 72 inch rounds and do up to 10, 12, excuse me. Um, most people don't have those. It's usually the eight to 10. Though. Right. It's usually <clears> the <throat> smaller rounds and that is usually eight to 10, 10 people at a round is a little tight. Um, but it's doable. If you need to optimize your space, you're going to need to put 10 people sometimes. And if you have a really elaborate table setting, meaning you have the oversized chargers, you have the plates, you have all the forks and knives, you have multiple glasses, you have a big centerpiece. Yeah. With 10 people at those tables, I'm like, you, I mean, it's, it's crowded. It's very crowded. And, uh, you, I mean, again, you can do it and your guests, they're not sitting there the whole night. They're sitting there, they're eating right. there. Right. And then the, people are up moving around, they're talking, they're dancing, whatever. Um, so it's really just that, that hour <laughs> where they're sitting down for dinner or they're watching your first dance or something like that. So it's not the worst thing in the world, but just keep in mind how much stuff is going to be on that table. Absolutely. So if we go back to the sweetheart table, back uh, to the sweetheart table, you know, <laughs> the sweetheart table is nice in the sense that you get the chance to sit just with your new spouse. Right. And there's a little bit of, like you said, table for two, you guys get to, to have that um, space just to yourselves. A lot of times I see like on social media or uh, we get asked about, well, people will come up to you the whole night, right? Like it doesn't get very, like you don't get that time alone. And I always say that if I'm the planner, I'm going to be watching out for that, like trying to keep people from bothering you guys while you're eating, but it does tend to happen. So something you may want to consider is don't put the sweetheart table near the buffet <laughs> because yeah, if you can avoid it. <laughs> If people are lined up for the buffet and they're right in front of your sweetheart table, they're going to try to talk to you. Yeah. And then, I mean, that's just, that's just the nature. You're the star attraction that night. So mm -hmm. everybody wants to, everybody wants to see you. Uh, there's been a trend lately where sometimes the couple eats in the bride suite or eats away from everybody. And I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm mixed on that one as well because, um, because it's your, you invited all these people and you're having dinner, but you're not even there. You're the guest of honor. You're not even there. But I also get the fact that they want to, they want to actually eat. Because the bride sometimes won't eat or won't be won't be disturbed to your point, right? And they don't want to spill on your dress, you know. But no barbecue sauce on the dress, please. So you can put on some oversized bib, basically, and just chow down and get some calories inside, so you can make it through the rest of your night. But uh, I don't know. But it's 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 an option, I guess. It absolutely is, and I get it too. Because, like he said, um, it gives you a chance to actually eat to kind of maybe go to the bathroom, like get a minute with your your new husband, your new wife, um, and just have a, some time alone. Now, I would say that you you 
you shouldn't expect to be there for 45 minutes or an hour, right? That's a long time to be away from your party. So if, if they you eat behind the scenes, you mean? Yeah, if you <clears throat> eat behind the scenes. Um, you can usually put on the timeline maybe 20, 30 minutes and have the couple be served somewhere else. Um, that'll give you enough time to eat, and then you can go and join the rest of the Here's another reception. Thing. Speaking to all the photographers in the world, the sweetheart table, like I said, it can be decorated really cute. But also, when you're doing the toast, the couple sometimes will remain seated at their sweetheart table, and the best man, maid of honor, can stand right there, right behind them. They mm -hmm. can get in there. It's a real clean shot. It's a real clean video, uh, and it works really well for for some other events throughout the night. For example, the toasts. Yeah, so that's it. It can be a great focal point for photographs and also some of the other activities that happen later in the evening. I was going to say, if you have flexibility with the types of tables you have, like you have access to the longer tables, maybe some farm tables. And what a farm table is, is basically it's a table that doesn't really require a linen. Because if you have rounds, they're usually plastic. So you want to cover those with some type of linen. Um, but if you have a farm table, you don't necessarily have to actually purchase linens for those or rent linens. Um, you can just use the table as is because it's really nice looking by itself. Yeah, some people put it like a runner down the middle. A runner? Mm -hmm. is that, yeah. Like, yeah, table a runner. runner. <laughs> that's um, the right term. Uh, and some, you know, with less linens, that's one more thing you can push that budget somewhere else, right? Right. Uh, but again, and if you haven't brought in, those are hard to bring in, but usually some venues have them. Um, you mean the farm tables? The farm are hard tables, to bring yeah, because yeah. they don't usually fold up and they're usually not light. Right. So that's something <laughs> that usually, like, if you go to tour the venue, they'll say, these are the tables we have available to you and you can check them out. Um, so keep that in mind. Usually rounds, you need linens or the plastic, eight foot, six foot, you're going to need linens. But if you have farm tables, you don't. And there's You can get really creative too. Like she was saying, with mix and match, there's one venue I work at quite a bit um, and they have all the farm tables kind of, kind of catty cornered all the way down the left and right. So there's a, a nice aisle. But if they have the guest count that goes beyond those, They'll put rounds up front, which is usually the reserved ones for the parents, right. left and right of the sweetheart table. And it really gives a different look to the room. Uh, so maybe they have linens on four tables, the four that are reserved up front. Um, and then everyone else is in the farm tables, but it looks really cool. And I've seen a head table where it's kind of like a, yeah, it was a head table where there was a round in the middle for the bride and groom to sit at or the couple mm -hmm. to sit at. And then they had a, a two, six foot or eight foot left and right. And it looked pretty cool too. It was a kind of a different look, yes. right? Absolutely. So you can get creative if you have the flexibility with the mm -hmm. space and the types of tables that are available to you. Yeah. So another one that works really well, I'm going to show this one. It's the horseshoe table, right? The horseshoe head table. And again, at the base of the horseshoe or the rounded part, I mean, it's kind of a, a more of a, more of a straight horseshoe. It's not like bent usually, but um, the bride and groom or the couple will sit at the, at the very bottom of the horseshoe. Whereas again, maybe you have their, your maid of honor, or best man left and right of you with their date or their significant other. And then the two tables that shoot off of that. So you can do like a six foot or eight foot at the base and then two more six or eight foots coming off. Mm -hmm. You can detach the two tables that are left and right. So there's like a little bit of a gap for just for which what we did last weekend actually worked pretty well because you can still get through there. It was still basically in the shape of the horseshoe and, and it still worked really well for what you're trying to get because you can have your wedding party on the left table or the right table and they can swing around inside the horseshoe so you can fit all the plus ones in there. And if you have a big wedding party, it doesn't take up much space and it really can fit a lot of people. Right, right. And keep in mind that the horseshoe requires a lot of room, okay? So you need to be in a venue, in a space that has plenty of room to put the horseshoe because not everyone obviously is sitting at that table. Then you also have to have the rounds or the other tables in the space. Then you're also going to want to have your dance floor and room for your cake table, your sign-in table, all those other pieces. So the horseshoe table and then the other table we're going to show you in a second, they require more room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They tend to. Uh, and like she was talking about the other stuff, there are rooms that are just massive and everything's in there. The sign-in table, the right. gift table, the cake table, the buffet, the bar, the photo booth. It's all in one room, the dancing. But there are times when it gets spread out. And that's one of the topics I want to talk about. And since we're here, let's talk about it real quick. Um, if you have to put stuff in another, in another room, a sign-in table is a great thing to put in another room. The cake actually works well in another room. The photo booth, maybe another room. But if you start spreading stuff out like that, the bar, the bar, man, if the bar is in another room, and the dance floor is in one. You're, it's a big ask for the DJ because people will be at the bar. Yes. They go to the bar. Mm -hmm. They hang out at the bar. It's the bar. Why would you not hang out right. there? But I also want to have the dance floor going. And when it's in two different rooms, 
it really just divides your crowd up. Uh, and sometimes the bar venue, sometimes you can't move the bar. That's like, it's a set thing, right? And this is where people dance and this is where the bar is. But it's just a thing that I always consider when I walk in, I go, ah, the bar is down the hallway. Ah, yeah. It just really divides your, your, your crowd. And the other thing that we consider is can we provide music for that space if we are, you know, doing some type of dancing in one space and then maybe a cocktail hour elsewhere, we actually have to bring an additional speaker to set up. If you're not all in one room, you're going to want to have that conversation with your DJ or whoever's providing the sound to make sure they cover different locations. Yeah, but I usually try to cover that space during cocktail hour because I want sure. that background music. But once we open the dance floor and it gets really loud where people are dancing, usually your guests want a space to go and escape the, the music, right? right? And the bar is a good place to go do that or step outside. But if you have people, sometimes I've had couples say, we need a speaker here. We need one down the hall. We need one here. I want everyone to hear the yeah. party. And I go, no, you really don't. Because if you catch up with somebody, you see somebody like, oh my God, your, your favorite cousin, you haven't seen them for 10 years. Oh my gosh, how you been? Let's go catch up. And if there's nowhere for them to escape the music, they go, I can't, I can't. Yeah. I, go, I like your shoes. You watch the news? I said, I like your shows. <laughs> like you can't get away. You need that space where they can go and just have a conversation yeah. without screaming at each other. And that's a good point. But I think some people don't realize that um, you need to make sure, like if you have a vision for sound or music in another space, you better make sure to have the conversation with your DJ that they can cover that. Oh, and it's not the music. It's the MC. Right. I, I mean- Usually I'll set up in one spot and people are outside and I'll have somebody come up and say, can you make an announcement? Tell everybody to come inside. And I go, mm -hmm. you see my speakers right here, right? right. Do you think the microphone is just this magic thing that wherever I walk, the sound just comes from the clouds. Like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I go, I can only MC or make announcements where the speakers are. It yes. doesn't matter where that wireless mic goes. It's where the speakers are. That's where the sound comes out. I know that sounds obvious. It happens all the it time. Does. People are down the hallway. Can you make an announcement? I go, I can move the crowd. I've heard the cats, both of us have, many times. I go to the farthest end of the crowd and I say, hey, we're opening the room. If you would like to go grab your seat. And everybody knows that eventually you're going to move. They're not going to be in the cocktail right. space the whole time. And once you move that first little group, people are like, oh, something's happening, something's happening. And then the crowd just naturally starts to go. There's always a few people that are lingering that didn't get the, get the memo that you're not here all night. Please, we have other things we have to do. Move. And you have right. to go to those people directly. But, but it's not, I mean... So you don't need a speaker everywhere. You don't need to have an MC ability everywhere, mm -hmm. but it's limited on where it is. That's just where you're going to be making those announcements. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about the horseshoe table, but the fourth table, is this the last one? This is the last one. Last one is- A king's table. King's table, which is one of my favorite design tables um, setups, you know, because I think it really, it just looks cool. I don't know. It looks it very like- Majestic. Majestic and- Gothic. No, not no? gothic. Epic. <laughs> You're just coming up with words. <laughs> um, Spectacular. So a king's table is where the essentially like if you can envision the bride and groom sitting at the head of a very long rectangular table and then the wedding party. And if you have the plus ones are on the sides. Mm -hmm. So it's just one long rectangular table. And it works really well. If you have a very linear space as well, because the exactly. king's table or the, the horseshoe table can, like you said, gets a little bit more, it's long, but it's also wide. Uh, whereas if you don't have that much space, and again, every room is different, every layout's different. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you may have limited flexibility with what there's offered, but you can get creative and just kind of look at, you can ask the venue for sure, because they have probably seen it set up numerous ways. Maybe this is how it always starts. But if you say, hey, have you ever had somebody do this? They go, yeah, for sure. Here, let me show you some pictures. Or Sometimes we do it like this. Sometimes we do it like this. And you're like, oh, I like that so much better right. with whatever your vision is. So talk to your venue for sure or your planner or your DJ. They may have all seen that particular room. There's venues that I'm at that I have been at a hundred times yeah. and I've seen it laid out so many different directions. And sometimes I work with a planner and they go, I go, have you, or I'll talk to a photographer. Have you shot here before? And they go, no, this is my first time because I don't recognize them or whatever. I'm like, oh, I'm like, man, I've been here. But normally here the venue lot. or the planner takes the lead on the floor plan, not the DJ, what? but- <laughs> No, I'm just saying you could ask and see if it's yeah, the sure. you've seen before. Because I always ask where you want me. And sometimes I'm not even on the floor plan. But <laughs> while we're there, I'm showing the floor plan again. This is the sweetheart table. I'm showing it here. It works really well when you have tables left and right to put that dance floor centrally located and mm -hmm. have the DJ close to the dance floor. Sometimes you put the DJ in the corner and there's six tables between me and the dance floor. Yes. And it's not 
pleasant for the people that are right in front of me. That's for sure. And it's always the grandparents like, can you turn it down? I go, who puts the grandparents right in front of the DJ? Right in front of the DJ. But the other thing is the people on the far end of the room are really far away. The people in front of me, their ears are bleeding. And the people on the far end of the room are like, is the music even on? I'm like, oh, it's on. You're just so far away. So to have your DJ centrally located for both announcements and for music. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective as the DJ, I want to have my finger on the pulse of the dance floor. I want to be right there on the edge of it. Proximity is key and just be like, mm, 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 and just be right there with everybody. Right. Pumping that energy into the crowd. And when I'm back in the corner, it's really kind of hard. And sometimes during first dances, people stand up. I'm like, I can't are the couple, see. Are the couple out well, there? Well, and that's I what I was going to say it's too. Really, it's yeah. really challenging. If you're emceeing an event, which I never do, but you do quite often, if you can envision this, how impossible it is to make announcements or introduce couples into a space when you can't see what's happening, right? Like you have to be able to get the cues from the planner or whoever's on the other side and make sure you see what is happening so that you can make that announcement at the appropriate Absolutely. time. And it is really, I mean, I've done it and you can do it. It's just limiting. It's just challenging. It's mm -hmm. just, I'm kind of guessing sometimes I'm like, here are the bride and groom. Are the <laughs> maybe are they here? Can they are they coming out? You know, um, yeah. And it just really works well for everybody to not feel like they're they're far away, right? If I'm in the middle, there's like you can put the significant people up close to the dance floor so they can see stuff. Um, but then then some rooms have that other space. When you have an upstairs, for example, uh, sometimes there's a balcony and everybody. I'll go upstairs literally during introductions and I say, "Hey, come up to the balcony because it looks really cool for pictures and for the couple when they walk in and they're like, here they are, husband and wife.' We and I'm like, can you hear me in the balcony? Right up top. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. But um, sometimes you can put a speaker up there, but that's another like space that's kind of hard. And again, it's not hard if it's a balcony, but if there's people that are eating in another room, right? That's also something else you want to consider. You're like, oh, we can just put tables outside. We can put tables down the hall. Yeah, but yeah, but how are you doing? Your first dances. Right. How are you Toast. doing? Toasts. How are you going to announce to those people without having your DJ or your planner run down there every time? Like we're cutting the cake, and then they'll come down. And then they right. go back and sit. So keep that in mind. Uh, one, when you're doing your head count, if you're just bringing everybody and you found a venue that's kind of too small for your head count, right? And you start getting creative and putting people outside and stuff. Man, that's where it comes back to find a venue that fits your guest count. Yes. So you can use that space, have everybody be a part of the party, and not just get spread out on the back 40 in the lawn and it's you got to go out there and fight the mosquitoes to tell table 17 that it's time to do the dance. So, yeah, no, it's a good point. We always talk about like determining your guest count before you go and even look at venues so that you can, when you make your initial phone calls say, Hey, my guest count is about 150. Do you accommodate that? Well, like what is your capacity so that you can check some off your list if they're too small or too large. Um, and this will come into play like we're talking about today when you're putting together your floor plan. Mm -hmm. You will be happy you have the appropriate space to fit those tables, to fit those that guest count in. And one last thing when you're talking about the floor plan is where do you put the buffet? Let's say, for example, <laughs> if you're having um, – if there's no kitchen, if there's a plate of meal, they'll be in the kitchen. They'll just bring it out. But if you're, def if you're doing a buffet, which is more common than not in the venues that we're at, you're seeing – you can ask them like, well, what are you serving? How many tables are they going to need? If they're going to need three eight foot tables, yeah, holy cow, that's a lot of space there as well. Um, oftentimes, the venues have. If it was designed for a wedding, they will have that space, right? Yeah. But if it's a venue that was just like they converted the chicken coop <laughs> in the back, they mowed the back forty we're and made Texas. their venue. We're in Texas, yeah. and there are venues like that. And it's sometimes the buffet either they'll set it up and they'll strike it afterwards, meaning they'll put it away. Um, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's there the whole time. So. And you may be at a venue like, oh, it goes there, it stays there, it's not a problem, it's not in the way. But one thing I've seen people do is if they can, they'll set it up literally on the dance floor, have people go and eat, and then after that, while people are still, once they've had everybody served, and the couple maybe are working the room, talking to everybody, you've got that time to strike, get that stuff out of the way, sometimes sweep up the lettuce that's on the dance floor. Well, I was going to say, it's it is perfect. clunky. It is, and you have to plan for the staffing for that because who's doing that, right? Yeah. Like you, you well, can't just- the caterers is the one doing Exactly, it. but you need to have that conversation beforehand. Like this is the plan. Are you guys on board for striking the tables during the event? Because it doesn't just happen magically and it takes a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. The other thing to consider is lines. So if you are putting your buffet on one side and maybe the bar on another side, you need to leave enough space 
between the buffet or the bar and the tables for people to wait in line. Yeah, because once they queue up, it's gonna that's gonna be another whole space you're gonna need. Exactly, and so I've had it where the initial floor plan shows tables butted up right against the bar. And I'm like, well, where are all these people standing while they're waiting for drinks, right? Because you need a certain amount of space for people to be able to wait to get their drinks. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. And <laughs> and even if you're like, oh, we'll just have one table at a time. Have you been to a wedding? There's Even if you say, please be patient. Oh my DJ, God, it's my pet peeve. We're going to release the tables. We're going to get everybody fed as quickly as you possible. There's always two to three tables that were like, oh, he didn't mean me. He didn't mean it me. Is my I pet can peeve. just go and get my food whenever I want. Like, no, oh, please stay seated. We will get you out there. I literally have had events where I stand towards the end of the buffet line like, oh, you think you're getting up and coming and getting in line before I dismissed you? You are not. And the reason is, honestly, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but it it's hard on the catering staff. Um, you know, we're trying to make this move efficiently. It's not easy to feed 100 plus people in a certain amount of time. So the organization is key. So you're going to want to have someone there that is, like you said, releasing the tables effectively. And usually that's a planner or maybe someone with the venue. Yeah, well, it's not even that. It's like, this table gets up and goes get in line like, hey, you went ahead of the bride's parents, right? Exactly. They're paying for the damn thing. Yes. And you think you're going to go before them just because you're like, well, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Eat. Yes. And when one table gets up, the other table's like, oh, we can just go now. Yes. And then suddenly the whole half of the room and you're like, Ooh, it's a frustration so point. If you don't have room for that, like getting back to the floor plan, suddenly you have this massive queue and everybody's in line. Mm -hmm. And then like the wedding party's like, oh. Were we supposed? Yeah, you were supposed to eat first. You're in the wedding party. Right. The couple, the wedding party, the parents, and then we get to the other guests. But oh, it's very frustrating. Just a little. Ask anybody in the wedding industry; they'll no. all have a story. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So we really make a point of making that announcement, and you know, making sure that everyone understands that that's what we're doing. So on that note, wait, I have more things. The dance floor. Let's talk about the oh. dance floor really quick, because. People always think we need this massive dance floor because we're going to have so many people dancing. And I'm like, you have 150 guests, right? Let's say. This is true. I don't want this massive dance floor that even if everybody's out there, it still looks like sparse, still looks like it's not full. And right? it's intimidating to your guests. It is. This huge space to dance it in. It is. I want a small dance floor that looks packed. I want one big mosh pit, sweaty mess of a people out there. Because if you have this huge <laughs> dance floor, people come out to dance, you have... Your, your people you work with over here in this group of five to six, you have your cousins over here that are maybe three to four people dancing, the parents over here. Like it's just, it just Not doesn't lend itself to the big epic party that I am always shooting for. So feel free, bring that sweet, even if you have the space, right? Compact that dance floor, bring those tables in a little bit, bring that sweetheart table in, push your DJ in a little bit, make it a very defined space for the dancing, not just Oh, we pushed everything to the side and there's 300 square miles of dance floor in the middle <laughs> and the DJ is supposed to get this place looking packed. No. I mean, if you have 300 guests, yeah, be aware of that. You don't want a Yeah, you don't want everyone on top of each other. Tripping over the so chairs. Much. Yeah, you don't want that because I've seen that as well. Um, but my point is, if you've got an average size room, an average size guest count, bring that dance floor in. Make it smaller. Plus, yeah. you can open up more space for other tables and room for people to walk between the tables. The staff I think the point and the guests. Is you don't need as big a dance floor as you think you do. There you go. Most times. Most I times. mean, most conversations we have, people think they need a lot more space than they do. Always. Yeah. And I'm like, no, make it small. Make mm -hmm. it big and fantastic. Right. You said make it small, make it big. Make the dance floor small, the party big. I in think my is head, what <laughs> In my head, it made perfect sense when I said <laughs> That's usually how these things yeah, go. Yeah, right? So- Thank you for listening to episode 11, all about your wedding floor plan. We hope you enjoy all things Wedding Duo. If you haven't already found us, we're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. We have theweddingduo.co is our website where we do virtual planning. We launched our music planner. So if you're looking for help with your music stuff for your wedding, check out our shop. Get yourself the planner. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, and it's just kind of like, what songs do I need to pick? and what songs would work well for that event. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how it's laid out in an order that we think works well. But again, this will bring me to this point. It doesn't matter what everyone else thinks. It's what you think. It is a very personal day, your wedding day. So whatever your cousin did, they're like, oh my God, I would never. Like, that's great. It's not your day. Don't let somebody talk you into something you don't want to do or talk you out of something you have your heart set on. It is your day. You do you. Absolutely. Happy wedding planning, y'all. We'll see you next time.
so thanks for listening to our podcast. If you found any of this information helpful and you know someone who may be engaged or is a maid of honor, maybe you could tell them and share it with a friend. Absolutely. So screenshot this episode, share it on Instagram, on Facebook, and tag the wedding duo. We promise to share the love back. Also, if you are interested in more resources or the show notes, you can go to theweddingduo.co. We have one-on-one virtual sessions, a shop, all sorts of fun stuff. Check it out.